Good morning, good morning, my brothers and my sisters. We are turning on the lights here at the Church Town Church of God on this chilly willy Friday morning. I believe it's February 16th, the year of our Lord 2024. It is Friday, which you know what that means. Every Friday, we remember Good Friday. And every Sunday, we celebrate the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. <clears throat> you know, it's cold out because I have my Hawaiian hat on. Aloha, turning on the lights. I'm fired up today, just a little bit. Talking about all kinds of different things this week. It's been a good week. It's been a busy week. Today, I might goof off a little bit. What? What do you mean, goof off a little bit, Pastor? You only work an hour a week anyway. Well, let me tell you. I might be goofing off a little bit today because I need some time to goof off. But before I do, I would like to share with you a little bit about what we will be sharing on Sunday. Now, if you are a church Tonian, you need to figure out where the inspiration for these sermons, the past three now, this Sunday and the previous two, are coming from. And the clue that I'm giving you is that the clues are all around you. Oh, what does that mean? Father, we pray your word will go out this day. Mm. and change hearts and minds that people will grow in their relationship with you and that people will come to know themselves better and what it means to be an image bearer of the Most High God as the Beatitudes teach us, craving, hungering and thirsting for righteousness understanding our need for a savior. Let us be reflections of you in the world, Lord. Let your church be a shining city on a hill. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen, amen, and amen. I'm not gonna be here forever this morning. So we're going to go ahead and get started. I don't know if how many people will check in. We had a ton of people Tuesday morning. Maybe I should move turning on the lights back till after nine o'clock. It seemed to get more people able to watch it live. So if you are watching this and it is on delay, but you could watch it after nine, give me some feedback on that. Or it doesn't matter. It goes up on YouTube and you watch it whenever you want to watch it. So you can give me some feedback on the time. I can do it before my beloved goes to work or after. Right now, we have one of each. I do it after my beloved goes to work because on Tuesdays, I take Mackenzie to kindergarten. And on Fridays, I do it before because I don't have Mackenzie. So give me some feedback if you like it at 8.20 or a little after 9. Yeah, Facebook does what Facebook wants to do. I've learned that. I can tag. I, I'm pretty sure you're tagged. Um, again, if you're watching this and you got a notification and this is on your feed and you don't want it, let me know. I have no intention of, you know, making this something that, you know, you don't want on your feed, whatever the case may be. But give me some feedback on the time. <clears throat> we were talking about the new covenant. Now, Tuesday, we talked about more contemporary events. We talked about pop Christianity, pop culture. And by that, I don't mean Korean pop music. I mean popular culture. What's popular in the culture today? Pop Christianity, trying to make popular Christianity. You change and you tweak and you do different things in order to make it more palatable, as they say. So, Christians, Orthodox Christians, need not go deeply into their faith, need not worry about the word. 
We teach Christians that they are God, that they have God, um, that, uh, that, that they can do the things of God. I was going to say have God in them, but I meant it sort of in a negative way. You know what I mean? We have God in us, but we are to be submitted to his will, not have God in us. Huh. Well, I Facebook, Facebook, Facebook. Call all your friends and tell them. Go on Brian D. Warner's website or Facebook page right now. Turning on the lights is on. Check it out. Yeah, nearly everybody. What was I talking about? That, that's the only issue of doing this live. It really is. It's that I get so easily distracted because my brain operates like a brain of a goldfish. Mm, swimming, 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 bonk. What do I do now? You can tell that sometimes when I preach because you'll have that. I'll be just focused and in the zone and then the fan will go off or somebody's phone last week. You did, they beeped. It was a nice beep. It wasn't obnoxious. I'm like, is that the signal that the sermon is over? Are you trying to tell me something? But the, we, we talked about popular culture, pop Christianity. Though, so that's how I'm using that term. And w basically, we came out the other side when we look at the television ads and we look at the mega church pastors who are trying to get more people, more money, more followers, more, Right. They're writing books and they're saying, this is me. I can be in your home. This is me teaching you. Listen to me, listen to me, listen to me. All these different things. Very cult-like in their nature. Very directed away from God and away from scripture. Very much their own worldview. And then they say, oh, and by the way, God loves you. By the way, God says the same thing as I do. Isn't that amazing? So we, we want, and where, where we left it is that you, who's responsible? Well, there are good Bible teachers. There are good Orthodox Christian Bible teachers out there. And we must be discerning in finding them. And you yourself can know the word of God well. That's what the Protestant Reformation was all about. Do you think it was coincidence that it coincided with the development of the printing press? Do you think God made that some sort of weird coincidence? No, the word of God is meant to be in the hands of God's people. You have the word of God. There is a responsibility that comes with that to know the word of God so that when you hear things, when you experience things, there can be this voice this discerning spirit within you that can say, nope, no. It's not what Jesus said. That's not what Jesus did. That's not what covenant means. That not, that's not what that, why are you taking that verse and saying that about it? Don't you know where it is planted in scripture? Yeah, chances are that individual does know, or maybe they're ignorant enough that they don't know, but they're trying to use it to manipulate people. God doesn't use his word to manipulate people. He, his word is used to grow people. As we know who he is, we know more of who we are because we are created in his image. And I'm going to preach that until my last breath. It's not God in our image. Well, we can know God because we can look at ourselves knowing that we are in the image of God. We can look at ourselves and then we can say, well, that must be what God is like. Why is that flawed? Anybody from the, from the back row? Why is that way of looking at things flawed? Because we are flawed. And so me with my ego and my pride and my lust and my, all these different things that are inside of me that are not righteous. And then I, I say, oh, well, then God must be the same way. That's crazy talk. I must go through the word of God in prayer, discerning, understanding who he is. Now I see those things reflected in me. No better place to go than the short little passage, the three, the three little sections of the Beatitudes. I'm going to preach a sermon down in Frederick, Maryland. 
The first sermon of the, I'm going to preach three in a row. Three sermons that nobody wants to hear. And the first one is that is called, you are in no condition to play God. And we look at the Beatitudes and, and how God is seeking the hearts of man. And then we'll look at who God is. So in order to make that point, this is how we look at God and how we know who we are. But we are in no condition to play God. And we are in no condition to determine and define who God is. If we say, well, I'm a reflection of him. So therefore, he, it must be a lot like me. Flip that. You're that close. And remember, Satan doesn't matter. It doesn't matter to Satan if you're that close or not. But it's the other way around. You study God. We know who God is. And then we can discern, ah, this is how a human is meant to be. <clears throat> and then we read his word. And like I said, no clearer example than in the Beatitudes. And as far as the idea of he meets us where we are, we talked about that extensively on Tuesday. Yes, but there's a huge Christian but in that one. He meets us where we are. God's love is unconditional. It is radically inclusive of all humankind. Bring, he, he loves you. He wants everyone. However far they have strayed, whatever is wrong with them, and we all have things wrong with us, he, whatever, bring it to him for redemption. That's the key. He meets you where you are, yes. And he says, lay it at my feet. Be redeemed. The sin in your life, your being, be redeemed and know what it means to be human. That's what we're just talking about. Know what it means to be human. And I'm going to reinforce that point. The ministry of Jesus begins. And we, we know where I'm going with this, if you know the word of God, because you know some of the first words that Jesus preached when he began to minister, when he began to call people unto him. Jesus heard that John had been arrested. He left Judea, returned to Galilee. This is Matthew 4. He went first to Nazareth and then left there to move to Capernaum beside the Sea of Galilee in the region of Zebulun and Naphtali. This fulfilled what God said through the prophet Isaiah in the land of Nebulum and of Naphtali beside the sea beyond the Jordan River in Galilee where so many Gentiles live. The people who sat in darkness have seen a great light where so many Gentiles live. The word of God, the spirit of God is moving out. The lion of Judah is out and moving And for those who lived in the land where death cast its shadow, a light has shined. He is the light of the world. From then on, Jesus began to preach. Here's the, so the first things that are recorded that he began to preach. Repent is the first word he says. He moves to where the Gentiles are, where the people live in darkness, where sin is abundant, when they are not considered to be people of God, God's chosen people. And he says, repent and become a child of God. Repent of your sins and turn to God for the kingdom of heaven is near. Repent of your sins and turn to God for the kingdom of heaven is near. Christian teachers and preachers, particularly in pop culture all over the world, will do anything to get around that verse. They want to take every other little verse, pull it out of context and make the people believe that it believes what they want it to believe. I think I got that right. But you take that verse, repent of your sin and turn to God. For the kingdom of God is at hand. The kingdom of God is near. Take that one. Bring all of the sinners into your church. Say God's arms are open for all of you. 
regardless all of the your your politics what you believe about this that or the other thing how you identify you're living in sin you're living in lust you're living in addiction whatever come to the church what are the first words that we say to them repent of your sin and turn to god well that's not going to work for me because too many people will leave they don't want to repent we know that that's going to be the case we know that the path is going to be narrow. But that does not negate your responsibility as a teacher or a preacher of the word. And that goes for spiritual leaders and lay persons alike who are in charge of their own family. As we say, here's your word of the day, their own milieu, their own sphere of influence. Bring your sin to the altar. Come, all are welcome, more than welcome. And this is where the idea of God's love, Satan takes and says, this is actually not love, this is hate, because he will not accept you as you are. When Jesus is clearly teaching, repent of your sin, turn to God, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. So that's that. That's the, that's the capstone on Tuesday's conversation. And I don't have a very, very long time to go into where we're heading this weekend, but I do want to talk about the word covenant a little bit, just one aspect of how we're going to look at it on Sunday, covenant. Because covenant, when people talk about the new covenant and the old covenant, the primary point of discussion about how Jesus initiates the new covenant is that Jesus fulfills the law. And he tells us, I have not come to abolish the law. I have come to fulfill the law. There is not one jot or tittle of this, these words that will go away until the, we are created anew. Until my second coming and there, everything is created anew from garden to garden, right? Then it will be, we won't need those laws because you're, soul will be pure. Okay? So, and that's right. But when we look at the fulfillment of the old covenant, we look at the old covenants. We look at the old covenants. We look at the Abrahamic covenant. We look at the covenant made with Isaac. We may look at the covenant made with Joseph. We look at the covenant that is made with Moses and the people will become a great nation, numerous as the grains of sand. And, and there will come a time when all people, by my grace, I'm, I'm putting that in, will be, be able to become my children. And Jesus is the fulfillment of that. Because he is the fulfillment of the law, we now turn to him in faith. Faith in, in what exactly? Faith in what he said is true and came true in what he did. The sacrifice, the willing sacrifice that he made, we are taught, covers the sin of all humanity pours life into those who will believe now and grants eternal life to those who believe. We have faith that what he said is true and is made true by what he did. We have faith that he is the sacrifice. And what does that mean? We, that means that God's Holy Spirit pours down upon humankind. And those who will believe will be given the gift of life now by the power of God's Holy Spirit. And that goes for just the Hebrews. Ah, everybody. Everybody. And so the, the fulfillment of those covenants that we saw with Abraham, Isaac, and Joseph with Moses and foretold by the prophets, which we're going to look at one next. 
is fulfilled in Jesus. We talk about moving from under the old covenant to the new. The new is there's this fulfillment as God's Holy Spirit, the grace of God, right? The righteousness of Jesus Christ covers all humankind for those who will believe. We move from works into faith. We move from works into faith. Jesus willingly sacrificed himself for all, and then we are called to willingly, spiritually sacrifice ourselves to him. Repent is a verb, something that you do. Turn to God. That's a verb. It's something that you do. Well, that's works. I, I, I guess we could argue that around and around and around. When Jesus says to the people, the Gentiles to whom he went, repent and turn to God. If you want to say, well, that's works based. Uh, I can't. You and I are just going to have to agree to disagree on that. There's no way that I can be made and have been made an autonomous moral being. Right. And not then make the choice that is before me. If I have free moral agency to choose, but yet God doesn't let me choose, that doesn't make any sense. So our actions, if you will, are trusting, right? Repenting, trusting, following. Those are very intentional behaviors of those who want to become the children of God, repenting and trusting, and those who are the children of God following. There's no escaping those verbs in scripture. So you can say whatever you want, but we can still point out those verbs that we are commanded to do. And when Jesus turns around after his own baptism, after his own wandering in the wilderness, and, and begins his ministry, and the first word out of his mouth is repent. Who do you think he's talking to? He's not mumbling to himself. So you can argue all you want. No, we're not free moral agents. It's all been predetermined since the beginning of time. Okay, then I guess this is all just a dog and pony show. I guess all these verbs that we are asked and told to do, we don't have any choice or we just go through the motions because it's all been predetermined. When I go around preaching, repent for the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and turn to God. I go to church town and I put down my soapbox and I stand in the middle of high street and I say, repent for the kingdom of and turn to God. For the kingdom of God is at hand. It doesn't matter if I do that or not. It doesn't. So you can't convince me of that. And if you are of the mindset, otherwise, I probably won't be able to convince you. But I see a lot of verbs. I see a lot of intentionality in our relationship. Relationship. It's not one way. It's a relationship. It's a we are covered by the righteousness of Christ thus able to be in, say it in the back, relationship with God. Verb. Jeremiah 31. You want to hear about the new covenant? Let's go to the, let's go to the prophets of the old. Let's, let's learn how this is the fulfillment of the law, right? The Torah, and the prophets, all of the law and the prophets can be summed up thus. Right. And, and so here is a great prophecy, as, and we'll know it. And we're going to read this again on Sunday. The day is coming. This is Isaiah 31, beginning with verse 27. The day is coming, says the Lord, when I will greatly increase the human population and the number of animals here in Israel and in Judah. In the past, I deliberately uprooted and tore down this nation. I overthrew it, destroyed it and brought disaster upon it. But in the future, I will just as, as deliberately plant it and build it up again. I, the Lord, have spoken. 
The people will no longer quote this proverb, the parents have eaten sour grapes, but their children's mouth pucker at the taste. The day is coming, says the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the people of Israel and Judah. This covenant will not be like the one I made with their ancestors when I took them by the hand and brought them out of the land of Egypt. Right? The covenants that we spoke of, of what we call the, the fathers, right? The pillars of Christian faith. I will be their God. I will put my instructions deep within them. Think about this now. This is the new covenant I will make with the people on Israel of that day, says the Lord. I will put my instructions deep within them. I will write them on their hearts. I will be their God and they will be my people and they will not need to teach their neighbors, nor will they need to teach their relatives saying, you should know the Lord for everyone from the least to the greatest will know me already, says the Lord, and I will forgive their wickedness and I will again, never again remember their sins. Human beings, all human beings will have it written on their hearts that there is right and wrong. There is good and evil. And understanding that the standards of these things stem from God is the key. When we go and we say, repent and turn to God, people know what we're talking about. Because they've contemplated it. They feel it in their hearts. They know it in their minds. They know that they are worshiping something or somebody already. Could it be Yahweh? That I should be worshiping? That I should be following? And then here comes this preacher saying, repent. Turn to Yahweh. For the kingdom of Yahweh is at hand. And the people who have this written on their hearts go, that's it. Or so embedded in rebellion, so embedded in their lust for other gods or their lust for their own pride and power and position, reject that notion of repentance unto Yahweh so fiercely. And we see that, we see that so much, especially with child sacrifice. When we, when we say, no, that child in the womb is a human being. And Satan is saying, I demand child sacrifice. Abort, abort, abort. And we say, no, that child is a human being created in the image and the likeness of the most high man. When you start talking about that, that cranks the dial up to 12. God asks for willing, spiritual sacrifice of those who believe in him, trust in him. He does not ask for we, us to sacrifice others or us to sacrifice animals. He, Jesus Christ, is the example of the willing sacrifice, laying down my life to God, picking up the cross of Christ, and following. I'm going to talk a lot about that on Sunday. I'm going to talk a lot about, touch the concepts that we talked about here today, that it's more than just the fulfillment of the law. It is the fulfillment of the covenants that had been made throughout the Torah. And it is the fulfillment of the prophecies that are made by Jeremiah and Ezekiel and Joel. And what does it mean now to live in the new covenant with God? We don't live under the oppression of the works of the law, but we do live in the era of their fulfillment. What does that mean? Well, I'm looking forward to it. I'm still digging. I'm still reading. I'm still putting everything together. 
by Sunday morning, my brain will be, there will be words falling out of my ears and we'll be ready to go. But let's get into the word and learn what this means. Father, we do pray that your word will continue to teach us, grow us, that we will know so that the world can know. We know <laughs> how broken the lost are. That's why they're lost, Lord. They're walking in darkness, Lord. But as we know from the prophet Jeremiah, there is this knowledge of good and evil, of right and wrong that is written on their hearts. And we pray that your word will penetrate those hearts and let them know where that knowledge comes from, from whom it comes, the source of life, the source. We pray that our behaviors, our teaching, our preaching, all, any way that you lead us to be your disciples will grow your kingdom as people repent and turn to God. And they know what we know. The kingdom of God is near. Sun came out. I hope that you have an amazing Friday. Who knows what the weather holds going into Saturday. But I do know if you're a church Tony. And do not fear. We've got an incredible plow guy. Um, he'll be back around Saturday plowing and salting. Everything will be safe. Barbara you be safe. Traveling around, I guess, the next two weeks. I like seeing you there. That's, I'm being selfish, though. Because you're doing what you're called to do. Pastor Barb. God bless you guys. I love you guys. And we, you know, it's Friday. Everybody say it with me. Everybody type it. See you in church. <laughs>